economy a challenge after 45 years. Governor-General and Grand Chief visit Kaviang. And Superfund savings now available for withdrawal. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Tuesday's news. Our top story is later, but first, former retired Brigadier General of the PNG Defence Force, Jerry Singurok, says Papua New Guinea is still struggling after 45 years of independence. Speaking outside Port Moresby, Singurok says social indicators are very poor as the economic wealth of the nation stumbles to climb out of the debt created by successive governments. The former Defence Force commander says though development of infrastructure is visible, the country needs to open up more business with developed nations. He described 45 years of independence as the year of maturity. I say that 45 years is a, is a year of maturity, but the real questions that we need to ask today is that what have we achieved in the past 45 years? I say we are struggling. We're struggling. Um, our social indicators are not encouraging. Uh, unemployment, uh, law and order situations, uh, lack of opportunities. Um, we have a lot of challenges, but that doesn't mean that that we should stand, just stand and, and watch the world go by. We have to be proactive. Uh, proactive meaning that uh, we need to make our leaders accountable. Uh, the leaders need to be transparent and ask some real hard questions. What did we achieve in the past 10 to 20 years? If we haven't moved forward, then what will we do to move forward? And that's, that's a big challenge that, uh, that our leaders have. Because at the end of the day, it's all about leadership. People who have lost their jobs due to COVID-19 can now withdraw 20% of their superannuation savings. This follows the government recently passing amendments in the Superannuation General Provision Act 2000, which now legalizes the withdrawal. Parliament on Thursday, September 10, 2020, approved the amendments to the Superannuational General Provision Act 2000. This allows members who have had their employment terminated directly due to COVID-19 to apply for a one-off withdrawal of 20% of their own contributions up to a maximum of 10,000 kina. The authorized super funds of PNG that includes Nest Fund, Number One Super, Comrade Trust Services Limited, and Aeon Master Trust have acknowledged this government decision. They said once all formalities to operationalize the new amendment is completed, the authorized super funds will be able to lawfully process COVID 19 withdrawals. Each super fund will have its own processes, and members should expect to complete a specific form and provide employer verification that they have ceased employment due to COVID-19 circumstances. Another requirement is a super fund ID card or any accepted form of identification such as driver's license, employer ID card or passport. However, if the member remains unemployed after three months, they will be eligible to receive a monthly unemployment payment equivalent to 50% of their last monthly salary. Members who are already receiving their monthly unemployment payments may have reduced their balance, but they are also eligible to withdraw 20% of their remaining contributions of up to 10,000 under the new COVID-19 amendment. While that is good news for members who have been directly affected by COVID-19. They are also reminded that if they take out a COVID-19 withdrawal, they will earn less interest, reduce their housing advance eligibility and ultimately could result in 50,000 kina less in their account when they reach retirement age. The super funds encourage members to consider all options before withdrawing their superannuation savings. Shamit Poreambeb, National MTV News. 
The Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery, headed by Chairman Gary Jufa, says the public sector needs a major reform. The committee is set to crack down on poor performance by the public sector, including state-owned entities and the disciplinary forces to address the high consumption of the annual budget by this sector. The public sector emoluments eats up 4.6 billion kina of the national budget annually. The Marapi Stephen government has highlighted concerns about the funding allocations to the public service sector annually, with no visible results to show, and has tasked the Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery to look into the performance of the public sector. In preparation for the work ahead, the committee is mobilizing members and yesterday swore in member for POMIO and Shadow Minister for Health and Public Service, Elias Kapavore, effective giving the committee a bipartisan status. Kapavore, as a former public service minister, also brings with him bright ideas on how to address lack of performance in the public sector. And so, uh, when I was the public service minister, uh, I, I stressed on PMS, that's performance management system that must be properly done. And I, I don't think it's, it's been done to the way that we want yet. Uh, we, when I was the public service minister, we, I, I, I remember uh, terminating few uh, departmental heads because of poor performance in the public service, and the, the point that is that we want to make very clear in the Public Service Management Act is is that non-performance non-performance is a serious dis disciplinary matter offence, and that warrants termination. That must be very, very made very clear. I think. Chairman Gary Jufa says the government is concerned that this sector consumes one third of the annual national budget, but their performance over the years have been poor. Most government departments do not have a mechanism to scrutinize the performance of their staff, investigate uh, allegations of impropriety, and preside in a committee to discipline staff who are errant or who are not performing. This is something that we want to change. Every government department should have such a mechanism, or, as stipulated or as stated by the honorable member, there's a possibility we can get an independent organization to do that. To begin, the committee will summon government officers and departmental lads who have been implicated by the Auditor General's reports to answer to their implications, while long-term strategies involve addressing issues and problems affecting the public service welfare. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. Kikori MP Sora Eoe has assured people in nearby districts that benefits from resource projects in their district will be shared accordingly. He says there are people from various Highlands provinces living on their side of the border and they are aware of it. There were also calls for the government to work closely with the people to develop these projects. Development for in a recent media conference, Kikori MP Soroi Ioe, local level government presidents of Kikori and project landowners raised concerns on project benefit sharing and other issues. The local MP says they are aware of district sharing borders with Kikori and they are people living on the Kikori side of the border and they will end so benefits from resource projects in Kikori are said accordingly with the districts. Well, our brothers from Okapa also live on our side of it. So these are things that we are already mindful of. We want to, when time comes, we want to ensure that those people are not forgotten. No. And not forgetting, you know, we have people, districts that are sharing boundaries with us, like uh, Yalibu Pangea, for example. According to the local MP, there are many projects in the district that they are willing to develop. Some of the projects include Papua LNG, Twin Star and EHU Special Economic Zone. However, there are other issues in the province that must be addressed. The local MP further highlighted leadership issues as a hindrance to service delivery. Why is the province backward? Why is Gregory backward? Because leadership, both political and administrative leadership. I can't blame this government or any government for the demise of Kikori District. I can't. There were leaders who came before me. Ihu Special Economic Zone project was recently approved by the government. Former Gulf Governor Havila Kavo further thanked the government for approving the project, saying it will bring tangible development into Gulf Province. One of the first kind of project in a country, and I want to thank the government for supporting the program. Yes. Uh, in a nutshell, this project will enhance economic growth for the country as a whole. Yeah. Uh, also, 
affecting the uh, development of Gulf province. However, concerns were raised by presidents and local landowners for the government to involve the people in the development of these projects. They say there must be wider consultation with the landowners. That um, involvement of uh, people and people meaning landowners or project areas, if you can take them on board right from the start to the completion of the project, I would really appreciate. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. National MTV News continues with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. Papua New Guinea's economy has experienced one of the most difficult years in its 45-year history since independence in 1975. Prime Minister James Marappa said this during an interview with MTV yesterday, admitting that the global COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 has affected PNG's economic growth and also has exposed the weak areas that government has neglected in past years. Maintaining investor confidence is, therefore, a major challenge for the government and banks in the country are also faced with this challenge when dealing with shareholders. As Papua New Guinea gradually adapts to the new normal in the face of global economic recession as COVID-19 cases continue to soar into the final quarter of the year, Prime Minister James Marape admits that the pandemic has exposed weak areas in the country's economy. It's cost global economy to contract by 10% minimum uh, and likewise Papua New Guinea economy that is totally dependent on what is happening out there in the world has also faced that contraction uh, and in that contraction it means we have less money to be spending on key crucial sectors especially essential services for our people. But the Marape Stephen government is keen on investing in key economic sectors to help the country recover and sustain going towards the end of 2020 and into 2021, after going through difficult times in recent months amidst experiencing negative economic growth. So whilst the economic growth has uh, declined globally and for us domestically, uh, government must step in. In the absence of private sector investment, uh, governments must bridge that gap. And that's what we've done in our supplementary budget we prepared for 2020 to ensure we readjust the numbers and for government to borrow a little bit more and to re-inject that borrowing into key investment areas that will stimulate growth in our economy. But clearly we're not um, isolated from what the rest of the world's going through and you know we've seen commodity prices fall as a result of demand falling. That's unlikely to bounce back. Um, we've had some of our major mines closed, Pogara, Newcrest for maintenance, I think their annual maintenance schedule, Octeti was closed with uh, a COVID um, outbreak there. Um, that clearly ha has an impact on, on the economy overall given our reliance on the resources sector and again I support um, the, the government's push on SME growth, uh, growth of the small business sector. Maintaining investor confidence is a crucial challenge for the PNG government at this point in time. It is also a challenge for banks in the country as they deal with investors with, from overseas and also from within PNG. The number one question they ask us when we're talking to them or, or engaging with them is what's happening in PNG. So what are the prospects for the economy? What does the um, government administration look like? Is it stable? Are they being seen to be doing the right thing? So I think um, giving foreign investors in particular, and, and you know, PNG is reliant given its emerging nation status on foreign investment, it's important, I think, to give a positive vibe. Denny Sorere, National MTV News. And the full interview with Prime Minister James Marape will be aired on Independence Day tomorrow at 7 p.m. on MTV's My Province, My Country wrap-up show. Head of State and Governor General Sir Bob Dada is among dignitaries who will celebrate the country's 45th independence in New Ireland province. The visit is upon an invitation by Governor Sir Julius Chan. Among the guests is also founding father and former Prime Minister Sir Michael Somare. 
While the country prepares to host different independent celebrations, few of the founding fathers of the country have come to mark the occasion. Sir Michael arrived in New Island and was welcomed by the host governor among dignitaries. Former Prime Minister Sir Rabin Namali also joined the leaders. Special guest and Governor General Sir Bob Dadai also arrived to join the people of New Ireland and other leaders on the eve of independence. The two makers of this country will both be here and our governor who is the host of this and including our former Prime Minister, the maker of this country, we call him the captain of this country and the engineer is our governor, Sir Julius. Not only that, the fourth Prime Minister of our country as well, Sir Rabin Amelieu, will all be here uh, to celebrate the independence uh, celebration, 45 year of independence. The head of state was given a parade at the governor's state residence. Among the feasting and other activities, the leaders will also witness the opening of the New Island Provincial Assembly building. And more special to us will be opening the New Island Legislative Assembly for us, uniquely built only in New Island for New Island. Jagla Pava Jr. National MTV News. The Department of Agriculture and Livestock Secretary Daniel Kombuk has encouraged local farmers throughout the country to remain resilient during this pandemic. The Secretary says as the country turns 45 years old, the department is aligning its key strategies to best suit small-scale farmers that make up the 85% of the agriculture sector. Speaking to MTV News this afternoon, the DAL secretary says there will be a number of reforms in the department going forward. We equally working hard but smart to finalize the agriculture medium term development plan 2020-2022 and the new strategic and corporate plan 2021-2025 to for the Department of Agriculture and Livestock. These plans and strategies will be put to strengthen the country's core agriculture business as well as contributing to develop subsectors like the fishing and livestock industries. These important agriculture plans and strategies will strengthen the core agriculture business within the agriculture sector as well as in as well as influencing the subsector productivity and contributions to economic growth, prosperity of the nation and the well-being of the Papua New Guinea citizens. With agriculture doubled as the backbone of the country since independence, the sector has seen limited resources and support given. This is seen through the deterioration of many major plantations and farms throughout the country that drove the economy post-independence. But as a way forward, the secretary says the department will align its plans to best fit small-scale farmers, most notably the rural farmers that make up 85% of the sector. The secretary also encouraged local farmers to remain resilient in this pandemic. During these difficult times of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as uh, uh, difficult times that we face due to financial uh, constraints that we have, I want to encourage all our farmers and stakeholders across Papua New Guinea who are working in all our uh, export uh, commodities and also in the livestock sector, in the horticultural industries. Uh, I, I, I wish you all a uh, uh, happy 45th anniversary uh, independence and uh, I want to encourage all of you to work at high because uh, we, we are yet to uh, prove to uh, Papua New Guinea that we can be able to produce and uh, to the quality and the quantity that is done in other countries. Stanley Over Jr. National MTV News. Air New Guinea will resume flights to Tari Airport in Hela Province commencing next Monday. Link PNG, a subsidiary of Air New Guinea, suspended services to Tari in July 2019 to allow for the commencement of major upgrade works to the runway by National Airport Corporation. Now with the runway upgrade works completed, Link PNG was pleased to be able to restore services to Tari 
and the surrounding communities once again. Prime Minister James Marape expected to be amongst the first people to use the Tari runway as he will be travelling to Tari tomorrow to celebrate independence in his district. Link PNG will be operating three weekly direct flights between Port Moresby and Tari every Monday, Wednesday and Friday using their Dash 8 aircraft. To Morbe now, a 27-year-old man from Sialum in the Tawai Siasi district of Morbe said he's passionate about the sea and that gives him the joy to serve his people as a boat operator. Slash Zan is one of the many who travel between Sialum and Lei. Zan has been serving his people of Sialum LLG, the only means of travel to the provincial capital. The 27-year-old father of two is no stranger to the open sea. Slash Zan began traveling between Sialum and Lei when he was seven years old on a boat with a 40-horsepower engine. His passion developed over the years and now works to transport cargo and passengers between Sialum in the Tewai Siasi district and Lei. In Sialum Morbe province, I'm a first license keeper. In Sialum Morbe province, we come up law. Newspaper, Lo National, Parad Lo National. Okay. Uh, I must plant them, plant the boat, the sink, and maybe save him life. Plo plant the man, Mary, and tap the soul, or God and bless him. Papa Mama, Lo Mia, to plant Lo to man, Mary, and to pass a bait and strong Lo Mina. Through Lo Bait and Lo Papa Mama, me look at Slab Blessing. Tewai Siasi District has three local level governments, including Sialum with a population of almost 12,000. The people depend entirely on sea transport when seeking services in Leo, Finchafen district. So Mr. Woke Woke Bogaman planted trouble fight to this last Akama Pinjalo Sialo Molsa Kilim Kati Moliet. Time weather bagara up Osem now stop there, Solwara bagara up stop. And still Mr. Xim Marasin government supplier to police or army still Mr. Kama Piet Luya. The young skipper has sailed past the Bobongara Passage at the UN Peninsula, where the Envy Rabal Queen ship capsized in February 2012. Slash Zan is not only wanted by his local men and women, but also by the district in delivering government services to Sialum, Tewai Siasi district headquarters. Zan has called on other young men to quit consuming illicit drugs and to take on the challenges in serving the district and community. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News. And now looking at the NASFUND market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.2870 US dollars in the interbank markets this morning. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0 0.2795 US dollars, 0.3792 Australian dollars. 0.4137 New Zealand dollars and 28.9 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher. Coffee and copra closed lower. Cocoa closed higher. Crude oil is trading unchanged. Palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher, the ASX 200 is trading higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading higher. National MTV News continues with stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. While the case of the death of Janelyn Kennedy is still before the courts, there is a letter purportedly author authorized by the victim's family and is being circulated on social media. The content of the letter demands 600,000 kina as compensation for the death of Janelyn, further claiming this will clear the tarnished Kaiwi reputation. The letter took to social media by storm. Immediate response following the letter were nothing but criticisms for the family of the victim. In response to the letter, Elizabeth Bradshaw, representing the family of late Janeline Kennedy, expressed disgust and outrage. 
The family has denied and refuted outright any claims of communication and negotiation with the family of Bosip Kaiwi for the purported compensation claim of 600,000 kina. Bradshaw stating in the response that this will not go unchallenged. As set out in the beginning of their fight for justice, Le Janlin's family maintained their no compensation, no bail stance. According to the statement of response, this fake letter comes following the second unsuccessful attempt for bail by Bosip Kaiwi at the National Court. Bradshaw in the statement says the family have never received any assistance in cash or kind from the Kaiwi family and have stood by this to date. She further states the fake letter is an attempt to circumvent the justice system, adding it was orchestrated by unknown persons purporting to be members of the Kennedy family. The family says they will not rest until the perpetrator gets what he deserves. The family of Bosip Kaiwi have yet to confirm any information with relation to the letter of compensation. Kilawani National MTV News. Six remandees who were at the Waigani court for their hearing broke out of the Waigani committal court's holding cell yesterday morning. Four of the six prisoners who escaped from Waigani courthouse have been recaptured by police. NCD Central ACP Anthony Wagambi Jr. said the prisoners escaped by removing a grill bar at the cells and squeezed their way through. Wagambi stating police received information that the six ran towards the hill overlooking Erima settlement. However, quick response from two police cyclists recaptured two of them. The other two prisoners were caught between the courthouse and Port Moresby Arts Theatre. The four recaptured prisoners were on remand for a range of serious crimes, including willful murder and sexual penetration. Two of the escapees who eluded police and are still at large included Peter Ali, who was on remand for armed robbery, and another whose identity was not taken. And Chukai Sports is next. Fidelis Sukina will join you with the details after the break. Tukai Sports. Good night and welcome to Tukai Sports. As celebrations spring up across the nation for 45 years of in independence for Papua New Guinea, the Red Cross Special Education and Resource Center with Book Belong Pikinini hosted PNG Hunters player Ase Boas. Boas has been part of their programs in improving literacy for disadvantaged children. The Red Cross Special Education and Resource Center with Book Belong Pikinini had their independent celebrations today. Part of the celebrations included Book Belong Pikinini's latest books, I Am Noah and Our Special Stories. Both books are significant to the movement of improving literacy rates in Papua New Guinea, and especially amongst PWDs or persons with disabilities. The book Our Special Stories has been printed in 10,000 copies and is for free distribution to all schools. The book is aimed at getting the discussion of inclusion started in Papua New Guinean classrooms. As a boss, the PNG Hunters 5-8 has been supporting BBP since 2016. Players such as Aze are extremely important role models for the children and are great advocates for the importance of reading and literacy for all Papua New Guinean children. I see that uh, there's a lot of uh, need to be to be done with the kids and you know with, with the time we are in and this, they are the future of this nation and so when I involved in 2016, see a lot of kids, you know, inspired by what we do, like in the rugby and stuff like that. So, you know, for myself, I see that my involvement will make a great impact in the life of these young, young kids growing up. So. Ase believes investing in the children today will have positive impact in the future for Papua New Guinea. Kilawani, Trukai Sports. 
It's the business end of the season as the Digicel Cup teams prepare to head into their final matches of the season proper. The minor premiership is on the line as well this weekend with the second place Rabal Gurias taking on the Wagi Tumbe and the top team Snacks Tigers taking on the NCDC Vipers. Our sincere condolences. The Digicel Cup competition is winding down their season with the finals just a game away. The competition has seen a shift in the top four positions during the course of the short-term season, but the Lace Next Tigers are still holding on to the top position since the start of the round. But the team was handed their first loss of the season by the third place Croton Hella Wigman, 24 points to 4 on Sunday. The weak men proved versatile in their game plan to snatch the victory from the competition leaders. The park and there is, they've come up with the goods. In other matches, the Mount Hagen Eagles managed a 36 points to 20 victory over the Lahanis. The Muruks defeated the Miox 22 points to 6. The Wagi Tumbe were victorious over the Gulf Isos 32 points to 16. The Vipers also managed a 32 points to 16 win over the Cutters in Kimbe, while the Gurias are unbeaten at home defeating the Dabaris 38 points to 20. With the final matches of the proper season this weekend before the finals the following week, the Tigers are holding on to the top spot on 18 points with the Rabal Gurias just behind them on 17 points. In third are the Hella Wigmen, while in fourth are the Port Mosby Vipers closing off the top four. The bottom three teams are the Dabaris, Korokalahanis and Gulf Isos. The Jonah Amban Oval in Minch Juwaka will host its third Digicel Cup fixture for this season when Wampnang Mount Hagen Eagles take on Gas Resources Limited Central Dabaris in round 11 of the regular season proper competition this Saturday, September 19, 2020 at 2 p.m. Papua New Guinea National Rugby League competition manager Stanley Hondina said the venue staff and the Minch people had shown great support and cooperation in complying with the Barnes protocols in the past two games held there. Meanwhile in Port Mosby there will be a triple header at the Sir John Guy Stadium on Sunday to end the shortened season. At 12pm Croton Hella Wigman take on PRK Gulf Iso. And at 2 p.m., JPG Wagitumbe play Egmak Rabal Gurias. The main game of the day in the triple header will be between the NCDC Port Mosby Vipers and the Lace Next Tigers, with both teams looking to hold on to their current positions on the ladder. With cases of COVID-19 present in the capital city, Stanley Hondina is hoping for a favorable response back from the controller's office in the next few days for fans to attend and watch games in Port Mosby as the competition heads into the final series after this weekend and you're watching national mtv news the weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back true kai sports <laughs> This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Fine and cloudy in Port Moresby. A shower or two in Popandita. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for Tuesday 15th of September 2020. From all of us here at MTV, happy 45th Independence, pleasant viewing, be safe, bye for now.